to another chat chat. Uh, thank you again for attending. This is really great. I'm super excited about today. We have two extremely rock stars of the community here in Chicago that I've known for a very long time and are very near and dear to my heart. Um, so just before we get started, I just wanted to make sure that y'all know that we have these monthly talks. Next Next month, though, it's going to be on a Monday in April, and uh, Dr. Inger um, uh, and Bernat Ziegler from uh, Psych is coming, or the Astro Center, and she's got amazing work, so she's going to talk to us about it. Um, and then also always uh, check out our Skinny Trees podcast. And oh, sorry, the slide before. Don't forget, we have the T37 training program, so we're always looking for um, referrals for um, trainees from undergrad all the way up, but we also have other training programs, like the Summer Chicago Czech Fellows um, uh, Research uh, Opportunity Program, and also um, we have some opportunities in bench science as well um, in fibroid work. So we have lots of different programs. Always check out our website for that information. Um, podcast, uh, and we also have um, uh, Dr. Linda Ray Murray was one of our podcast uh, speakers as well. So without further ado, it is my deep honor and great honor to introduce um, our speakers today, Dr. Linda Ray Murray and Jose Lopez. Dr. Linda Ray Murray has spent her career serving medically underserved. They both have. Uh, Dr. Murray has worked in leadership roles in many public health organizations, including the National Association of City and County Health Officers, Health Equity and Social Justice Team. In 2011, she was the president of the American Public Health Association. Uh, and today she serves as an honorary attending of the Cook County Health and is an ad adjunct assistant professor at the University of Illinois um, School of Public Health. And um, with, she certainly remains passionate about increasing the number of Latino and Black uh, health professionals and serves on the Urban Health Program Community Advisory Committee at the University of Illinois. She's been a true voice for social justice and health as a basic human right for well over 50 years. Um, Jose Lopez serves as the executive director of the Puerto Rican Cultural Center, um, Juan Antonio Correter, in Chicago, which he co-founded in 1973. Um, and he's an adjunct professor at Columbia College and at the University of Illinois at Chicago. Additionally, he is the co-founder of several major community-based institutions, among them Dr. Pedro Albizu Campo campus, um, Puerto Rican high school, um, an alternative school serving at-risk youth, El Rincón Community Mental Health Center, and the National Museum of Puerto Rican Arts and Culture. Presently, he is active in developing new praxis and theory in community and social empowerment, particularly in the areas of educational reform through the community as a campus initiative, and addressing health inequities through the building of a holistic community of wellness in Chicago's greater Humboldt Park communities. Um, please join me in welcoming Dr. Linda Ray Murray and Jose Lopez. Well, they haven't changed, uh, you know, so that's, that's the first thing. So um, health inequities are baked into this country. And, it, and since this is a center that's really looking at it, I think we have to remember that what's being posited with work around health equity is not simply to look at people that are less healthy for bad reasons, but to understand that health and disease is socially determined. That's, that's the key difference, and I think in the United States we don't talk about that often enough. And what that means if you believe, as many of us do in the world, that health and disease are socially determined, that means if you're going to keep people healthy, you have to address the power structure, the structural, how, how we set up our politics, uh, how we distribute resources in order to really address people's health. So, um, I, for me, um, looking at the issue of equity and health care, I go back to when I was a little boy in Puerto Rico and I saw hundreds of kids dying from ringworm. And I saw at a very, very early age, I saw an incredible rate of infant mortality. And that stood in my mind because um, in Puerto Rico, there are. Rural areas, there were 
two very, very important decisions. Both of them held by women. One was the Comadrona. She was the midwife. She came at birthing you, and the other one was the woman that was in charge of the burial, the burial, um, the whole ceremony of the burial, and the person that died, and that was my mother, my mother was the woman who did that, and um, from very early, I would see her preparing the people who had died, and in Puerto Rico, just like in most original cultures, the idea of death and living are, are totally intertwined. So you would basically take that person and you would wait that person for 24 hours and no one could go to sleep. But that person was always, there were no funeral homes, nothing like that. There were very few churches. You would always wait in the humble home that you would have and it would be on top of One of the greatest paintings of a Puerto Rican painter of the 19th century is called El Melor, the Week, of a child that um, dies, right? Um, and so that experience was something that seeing so many young kids die and sort of raised why is this happening from very early. Then later on, I would find that in U.S. history and in the history of all the colonial powers on Earth, the greatest emphasis in many areas was the emphasis on tropical medicine. Wow, these kids were dying from tropical diseases, yet there was nothing for them. Because in Puerto Rico, by 1915, you developed one of the best schools of tropical medicine linked to the University of Puerto Rico. And that was basically to prepare the people, the soldiers, all the occupiers all over the third world to be able to be healthy in the occupation of those colonial areas. And that's exactly what happened in Puerto Rico. And so that was my take at least in terms of health and equity very early. So both of you talk a lot about knowing our history and to truly understand what is going on now, we have to recognize what happened. So can you talk a little bit about that? Well, I, I think that, um, I think we've all heard people talk about that, whether it's Malcolm X or, or someone else about the role of history, but history is really alive with us. The way we teach it, we try, we try to scare kids about it and we ask them to remember stupid stuff. But history is right in this room. Um, and when you think about history and health inequities, you can look at American history and understand some of those inequities. So for example, for African Americans, uh, descendants of slaves, the health gaps that existed because of structural racism and, and uh, class um, and gender problems, um, were wider uh, after Reconstruction was, was abandoned and after the Democratic Party took over the South um, and stayed wide for quite some time. Uh, and then we see in the late 50s and early 60s with the rise of the civil rights movement, of the modern civil rights movement, because there were other civil rights movements before that one, um, you can see, you can track the narrowing of a number of our biological measures, uh, death rates, et cetera. Of course, it's not any one thing. It's always complicated. But then we have other things, as, as Dr. Simon well knows, you know, even though some, there's been some narrowing, uh, we've seen an increase again in the late 70s. So why does that happen? Why all of a sudden you have things narrowing and then increasing again? So that you have to understand the political structure and the history of the country when you think about that. So maternal mortality, for example, in this country for whites, for white women and women of color is increasing. Everywhere else in the world is decreasing. In the United States, it's increasing. We should be asking ourselves why. When we see, even though they are minor in terms of actual numbers, when you see life expectancy being very level or 
in our case, decreasing in the United States, while the rest of the world life expectancy continues to increase, this points to a major problem. And those of you that are being trained in clinical fields, you ought to be worried about this. This is like a vital sign of your country. Something bad is going on when this happens. So if you don't have a grasp of history, then you lose some of these problems. If you think the world started today, you won't realize that maternal mortality was improving and now it's gotten worse. You won't realize that we've been able to narrow racial uh, health inequities in a period where the country was moving forward, and we've actually seen a reversal in that. And you can see this, in whether it's the number of, of black uh, teachers in, in Chicago public schools, which has gotten worse, whether it's school segregation. You know, I'm a child of the 60s. I was in elementary school uh, in 1954 when Brown versus the Board of Education came down. But school segregation is actually not better and in many places worse than it was when I was a little girl. So that is critical if you're going to actually solve what's going on today in our schools, or if you're actually going to solve what's going on today in our communities and why people are dying before they should. So, so you both are at, starting on this question. I know it, but I almost say I'd like you to start with this. So how do you think the historical context of systemic racism plays a role in education and healthcare and housing, et cetera, just to kind of kick back on what you just said? Um, well, I would have to say that our story of this problem for me begins almost 500 years ago. Um, du Bois writes his book, The Souls of the Black Folk, in 1923. And in it, he says the problem of the 20th century is the problem of the colored people. But in a lot of ways, if you study what Du Bois was grappling with, he wasn't just grappling with the issue of racism in the United States. He was deeply involved, and you can see it at the end of his life, because he obviously was living in Ghana, how he understood that the problem was not the binary of black and white, it was the problem of the color line. And the color line begins in 1492. And obviously, as we will discuss it, I will show you how this happened, but I'm not. What I'm going to say to you is that if almost 500 years we constructed a system called the colonial enterprise, which by the way for me and the way I would explain Du Bois is that Du Bois is looking at the problem, you could have said the problem of the 19th century, the problem of the 21st century, the problem of the 18th, the 17th, the 16th, but he will have to stop them because there was no color line before for the United States. We constructed that in order to justify. So for me, racism is constructed as a structural system to justify colonial practices. And we can't talk about the African Americans in the United States or the Native Americans in the United States or the people let's say in Puerto Rico or in the islands like Martinique and Guadalupe without speaking about a colonial reality. And so if we look at it from that perspective, I would say that in order for you to understand um, sort of what's happening in the world today, you will have to probably try to figure out what was happening 500 years ago. So today we have the coronavirus and everybody's talking about it, right? Well, imagine that in 1492, 1493, right after that, the Europeans introduced a whole host of diseases in this continent that left 100 million native people dead. That's a Holocaust. We don't talk about that, but it was mums, and it was smallpox, and it was syphilis, it was all those things that the European was immune to that the native people were not. And so, in that context of world health, is precisely the ability of, or obviously the process of the taking over of people across the world that in many ways informs this world health crisis. It, they're, they're very much linked. And I think, you know, when, when we create a crisis of, of the 
coronavirus, we should also think about the crisis that was created in the beginning of the 1500s with the introduction of all those diseases, which the Europeans ultimately liquidated a great deal of the population of this country. Well, again, I think I think I think in the United States, not only do we not talk about racism very much, when we talk about it, we talk about it stupidly, which is a fascinating thing because we're like we're like the world experts on racism. Okay, so explain that. So, so. What do you mean by stupidly? this is why I love you both because you're so, frank. So we, so we, so we, we tend in the United States. I think the average person thinks about racism on the individual level, sort of like Sunday school, you know, be not. But that, you know, that's, that, that is of no import to me personally, frankly. But also, that's really not what racism is. Um, racism is a hierarchical structure that applies to the whole world. I agree with Jose in terms of what it justifies. But in, 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 I want, in, in medicine, we have to be really, really careful because this is the foundation of our medical science. And it's still present. You know, it's still present that, you know, they've done surveys that indicate that though I missed this lecture in, in medical school, I must have cut that class where, you know, I forget some ridiculous percent, 50 percent, 60 percent of medical students think blacks have thicker skin and therefore feel less pain. It's like what in what class was that? I didn't I wasn't there when they taught that. Um, so this hierarchical structure is not, first of all, a black white dichotomy. That's another myth. You know, so like Irish are less than German Anglo-Saxons and Italians are less than, you know, Irish. So now, you know, here as a black American, it's just like they're all white. What do I? But there's that hierarchy is really there and it operates in the world. And it and it is the foundational basis of colonialism and capitalism. And so when we have an approach to science. And I, I invite you to read Nell Painter's book, The History of White People. Start there if you want to start with some history. So that you can see the, the attempt to scientifically prove the biological superiority of whites and the biological inferiority of everybody else on a scale. Um, and again, this gets reflected over and over again. It's in our attitude toward groups of people so we worry that certain kinds of people are non-compliant, for example, in our in our clinical work. Um, so this is a this is a very dangerous process. It doesn't allow you to really look at what's going on. Um, so to say that structural racism is foundational to the society we live in, I think it's it, to me is clear. But it's also foundational to what's going on in the world. Um, so, so many of the problems we have that are going on in the world come from a structure that's designed to keep white supremacy and the ascendancy and to allow the people that are running the world to continue to run the world. That's why it's so critical to have a clear understanding of what we mean when we say inequities, mm -hmm. health inequities. Because again, if you think it's just some of my patients don't have money to get, a, to get on the bus and come and see me, that is that is true, right. but th that is not really what's going on and what's really producing the health inequities and producing health. That's the other mistake we make. It's not just a question of producing disease, which is a problem, but there are ways to produce health. Right. And as and to me, as physicians and nurses and public health people, we, this is what we should be asking. How do we keep a community healthy? How do we keep a city healthy? How do we keep the world healthy? Well, there, there are things we can do to do that if we understand how Disease and health are socially determined. Do you want to add to that? Or? No, I, 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 I would totally echo that. Um, my, as a Puerto Rican, I obviously have been informed by, as I started earlier, what uh, this issue of health in relationship to colonialism and racism. But I, I think it's really important that um, you, you understand in, in the case of Puerto Rico, you're talking about a country that has been ruled for 122 years 
under an amazingly racist conception of um, history, and that is Puerto Rico is under the territorial clause of the United States. And what did that do? Well, the U.S. Supreme Court, beginning in 1901, began to articulate that, that vision. And by 1922, it declared Puerto Rico belongs to, but it's not a part of the United States. It belongs to, but it's not a part of the United States. If you go to the U.S. Congress, Puerto Rico is under the Department of Interior. If you go into the U.S. House of um, in the Senate, if you go into the House of Representatives, it's under the Committee of Natural Resources. So when you think about Puerto Rico being a natural resource of the United States, then you can begin to understand this doctrine that was established in 1901 of separate but unequal. Remember that Jim Crow was separate but equal in the case of Puerto Rico and also later and it would apply to Guam and Samoa, it would be separate but unequal. And the idea is Puerto Ricans were a mongrel race which could never ever hope to be equal to the people in this country. And to this day we're not. Puerto Rico has no political power in relationship to any of the decisions that impact us, including health care. And it's interesting because if I took talk about inequity, Puerto Rico and the U.S. territories, the Virgin Islands, Samoa, and Guam, you get less Medicaid, less Medicare. Things that people pay for, we get less than. So it's pretty clear how that is well established. But what we did actually, March 2nd, 1917, was to make Puerto Ricans citizens of the United States. Now, March 2nd, uh, we're talking about the fact that the U.S. would enter the First World War in April of that year and needed soldiers. Puerto Ricans were then given two rights as citizens the right to die for the United States in every war that has been fought since 1917 all the way to the war in Afghanistan and the right to leave Puerto Rico without papers to the United States. So obviously when you talk about the how people are treated that way, when we look at the issues of asthma, when we look at the issue of um, AIDS, you're going to see a disproportionate number um, I mean, almost 15 years ago, uh, Dr. Steve Whitman did a study with Mount Sinai, and it demonstrated Puerto Ricans in Humboldt Park had the highest mortality rate due to diabetes. Now, is it because we were reading the wrong thing or because our whole diet had been transformed by a U.S. colonial practice? I think it's interesting and important to look at all all the different groups, um, you know, history doesn't go in a in a straight line. So some, you know, I'm not a historian. Some historians argue, I think it's a persuasive argument to me, that the American war for independence from from England was really not as radical or revolutionary as we think. And there were clearly components of it that were simply trying to maintain slavery and the transatlantic slave trade. Uh, now. And, and even our relationship with Mexico, stealing the northern part of Mexico is, is part of that same thing. One of, the, one of the reasons Texas is how it is is because the Mexicans took a position, well, you could come and farm the land, but you can't have slaves. And so we have the Alamo and, and the seizure of the northern part of Mexico. In fact, um, the... You all are familiar with the history of lynching in the United States, not as familiar as, as perhaps we should be, uh, but uh, conservatively at least 4,000 blacks were lynched that we can document. At the same time period as blacks were being lynched, Mexicans and Mexican-Americans were being lynched in similar proportions. And one of the reasons why that's not held up as often is because the NAACP didn't read Spanish, so it, because one of 
Don't laugh. This is like this is like this is basic method historical methodology. So like, how did the NAACP know when people got lynched? Right. They read the local newspaper. Right. It was in the, but they didn't they didn't read Spanish language. They didn't read the Spanish. So so in the past twenty or twenty five years, more or less, you know, um, uh, Mexican American historians who are literate in Spanish were able to bring that up and document the proportions. What, you know, we don't talk very often about the discrimination and racism against Asians, starting with the Chinese, the Chinese Exclusion Act. We don't talk about the fact that Native Americans couldn't vote till 1924, you know, in their own land. So, um, so it's not, when we, when we talk about structural racism and racism being the foundation of colonialism, this is a, this is a critical thing. Um, and it can't be uh, overemphasized, but it has to be done in a way that we understand what structures perpetuate that. Because the beauty about structural racism is you think it's scientific. Right? You think it's normal. You think it's natural. You don't realize that it's an ideological framework that's put out there deliberately for certain ends. So how do we dismantle structural racism? Places like this. <laughs> Microphones. Not so, 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 it, it, it could be a, so, so let me let me try to parse that a little bit. Yes, let's start so, with, let's start at the top level first, and I'll get to Northwestern in a minute. Um, I'm looking forward to this. Now, people people disagree with what I'm about to say, but lots of people agree with what I'm about to say. I don't think you can disentangle racism from capitalism and colonialism. Right. So to me, and I don't think you, and I, I don't think that you can achieve an equitable society, a just society under capitalism. I'm willing to be proved wrong, but I'm, I don't think so. That's just my personal opinion. Um, but in any case, that doesn't happen all at once. Um, for institutions like uh, Northwestern, so, th so this is an institutional problem. Okay, so there's a difference between structural racism and institutional racism. Um, it is possible for any institution, including Northwestern, to be less racist, to try to actively uh, uh, be anti-racist. Uh, that takes a lot of work and a lot of struggle. But again, I, I'm interested in looking at the structural components. So here's some, and I, you know, I come over here, but I, I could talk longer about U of I since that's where I spend more of my time. For example, um, and you, I think you told me that they actually inter interviewed a DACA student not too long ago. There's, no, there's nothing illegal about Northwestern making a decision that they're going to support X number of DACA students. That, and they ought to do that. They're getting, you know, there, there's nothing wrong with making a decision we're here in, in Metro Chicago. We're going to guarantee that a certain number of our spots in all of our educational institutions, whether it's on the Evanston campus or here, are going to be for people from, from the Chicago region or at least the Midwest. You know, um, There's no reason why, given the, the, uh, the fact that the number of black men in medicine has shrunk, there's no reason why you can't make a decision to do that. Um, there are other things. Why, uh, you know, Northwestern is not meeting its quote unquote charitable care obligations. Okay. So there's no reason why they can't say this is what we would pay in real estate tax for all these buildings here. And so we guaranteed minimally that we're going to have that amount of care to people in the surrounding communities. So there are all kinds of small things like that. They could also stop charging thousands of dollars to park here, for example. <laughs> no, no, I, I, that's all right. I, I took public transit this morning. I know about one time Melissa was coming over to U of I and somebody, I think she or one of her staff said, what about parking? I said, this is U of I. We don't, well, our parking rates are nothing compared to Northwest. Could afford it. <laughs> anyway, so, so um, student organizations can speak out on this. You have a lot of control and a lot of power. Are students on the admissions committees? What course? Do you have a course? I don't think you do. A course in the, in the School of Public Health curriculum. 
or the medical curriculum or the law school on racism. Why not? Most people in this, most people, most people with a college education today, unlike say 100 years ago, would agree that racism is a problem. They would disagree about how big of a problem, what to do about it. But is there, so this is a problem. It's a problem that's been going on in our country since its birth. How come you can pay all this tuition and get multiple degrees and never have a course in racism so that we can then decide, we can have an, we can have an intelligent fight? This to me is the difference between high school crushes and adult marriages. In high school and too many adult marriages, you fight over stupid shit the socks on the floor, when you really, instead of discussing what's really bothering the relationship, okay? So that's what we need to do. We need to have an adult conversation about why this country is in trouble, you know? We're talking about the coronavirus. Let me come back to that. I'd be missing my duty as a public health person. And most of you in this room, how many of you are in school right now, medical school? Not, how many of you work in healthcare? Some of you, okay. Well, in, in any case, our public health infrastructure is for shit. We've, we've allowed it to decay, okay? And so when I see somebody, even Fauci on the news talking about, oh, we're great. No, the country is horrible. You can have the greatest architect and engineers in the world, but if you build a bridge 200 years ago and then you never repair it, it's going to crumble today. So the reality is we, we are not prepared. Nobody really can be prepared for the pandemic that is coming. But people should understand how weak we are to meet this kind of crisis. We, we're weaker today let me be, than we were in 1950 or 1960. So most of our governmental health departments have very few clinicians or nurses on staff. We used to have lots more. You know, we have very few. The number when I started my career as a as a young physician, every state had a state lab. That's not true anymore. Lots of states have no state lab. So when we're talking about the ability to do the test for coronavirus, we don't have the capacity within our public health infrastructure to do that. And the capacity we have today is less than in the 1950s. We don't have the capacity. I think right now in Illinois, we're mo- in Chicago area, in Cook County, we're monitoring 150 people with two docs and, I don't know, maybe 20 nurses. You know, in 1950, there would have been many more physicians and nurses that were part of our governmental public health. So how does that happen? What thinking causes us to be ill-prepared like this? It's the same thinking that makes sure that we don't have a medical care system and medicine is not a human right in this country. It's the same thinking. So to me, when you see a problem like that, and we we like to stay in silos, when you see a problem like poor women cannot access abortions, if you have, you know, they can't do that. Or black boys, for every three black boys that start kindergarten, every 100 black boys that start kindergarten, in some neighborhoods in Chicago, by the time they're 26, three of them will have a bachelor's degree from some of our communities. Those aren't isolated problems. So what we need to ask as scientists is, what do these problems have in common? What are the root causes of these problems? And then how are they connected? Because in my mind, they clearly are connected. So it sounds like it's really important that communities interact with researchers and researchers interact with communities. Uh, Jose, what are some of the challenges from the community perspective with interacting with researchers? Because there's a lot of science. So um, today, is um, we, we celebrate in, in the Cultural Center our 47th year of the founding of the Cultural Center. Uh, we started actually a year earlier where we founded a high school for at-risk Puerto Rican youth who were being thrown out of the Chicago public schools. And that school is now, um, it started with 12 students. It is now with 200. But we were able in the process to foment the creation of the alternative school network in Chicago, uh, which are 43 small schools 
with wraparound services for young people at risk. And 20 years ago, we helped to create the Youth Connection Charter School, which are 23 small schools in Chicago under one charter, a non-for-profit, uh, community-based, uh, that services 4,000 African American and Latino youth. Now, I say this because when we started this discussion to create the Puerto Rican Cultural Center, we were discussing a vision that came out of the practice of the theology of liberation in Latin America. And one of the great um, sort of thinkers of that was a man by the name of Paulo Freire, who, by the way, all of you should read his book, Pedagogy of the Oppressed. And <clears throat> the idea that the theology of liberation posed was that we cannot just focus in on community organizing. We have to use community organizing for community building. And what does that mean? It means you begin to practice the idea of what would you envision in a future society. So when Dr. Murray talks about the relationship of capitalism to colonialism to racism, Obviously, capitalism, European capitalism, would not be where it's at today without its foundational basis and its pillar, which is colonialism. So, that said, I would have to say that we're not going to undo capitalism overnight. And we got to understand what Dr. Mary spoke about in terms of institutional and structural and begin to see how it is that we hold the institution responsible, that we are able to clearly articulate the problems of structural uh, colonialism and racism, but at the same time, that our communities need to begin to practice in their daily um, movements the society of the future. What do I mean by that? I mean that we have to create in our communities, parallel institutions. It's what the Black Panthers did. It's what many movements throughout the world have done. And that is, you don't wait for the system to respond. You create your own system. And in an embryonic way, you can begin to talk about the kind of future that we want. Without the breakfast program of the Black Panthers, we wouldn't have breakfast and lunch in the public schools of the United States. So in one way, they set into motion a practice which democratized education and being able to be at least eating halfway decent in a school. So what I'm saying to you is that 47 years ago, we began this idea of creating parallel institutions that address the needs of our community without ever saying, no, we're not going to hold the major institutions responsible or the system responsible. And so I can tell you that today we have 15 different initiatives in our community addressing a whole myriad of issues, including the first LGBTQ um, shelter for um, Latino LGBTQ homeless youth. And we deal with the people that nobody wants to deal with. But they are the real people on the street that we must deal with. But it's not only providing them with some services. It's also to provide them with a vision that they can self-actualize themselves, that they can be self-reliant. And in many ways, that's what history of African Americans in this country and probably throughout the diaspora has spoken to. To me, one of the greatest lessons of African American history is the history of the resilience of African Americans. 
So I always tell people this story. If you watch the Ten Commandments, the film, The Ten Commandments, or you read the book of Exodus, Moses tells the Jews, gather all your goods. If you remember, my God, the Jews had a lot of wealth in Egypt. They were able to build golden calves in the Exodus. If you had told African Americans in 1865, gather all your goods, what would they have? Absolutely nothing. Yet, within a very short period, African Americans built schools and churches and banks, all kinds of alternative institutions that met the needs of the African American people. And so it's in that context that you have to understand the resilience of African Americans without much help. And so I think that's something that's very valuable for us to learn. And more importantly, I would say that the history of the African people on this continent was extremely instructive. If all I do is I, I, I study the music and dance of Brazil, the samba, or the tango of Argentina, or the cumbia of Colombia, or the salsa of Puerto Rico, or the guaracha of Cuba, or the sones of Mexico, or the merengue in the Dominican Republic. And what I would find is that all of it is informed by African rhythms. And so there was those teachable moments that the African diaspora enslaved was able to maintain the spirit and even the history of Africa alive. And so that is an amazing lesson. So I think it's one, the resilience of a people that we have to celebrate, the resistance of a people, but also how we begin to construct many things that speak to us in terms of our own reality, addressing it right away, and holding responsible institutions like Northwestern, institutions like the University of Illinois, to respond to our needs. And I think the, the key thing of what Jose is saying is how it's done. And I'm glad you brought up the Black Panthers, which are particularly relevant to healthcare, but any of the other things. The, the key in my mind for communities that are oppressed is to is while you build a local structures to meet your immediate needs, because if you die this week, you're not going to be liberated next week, right? right? So but that it's done in a transformative way. So there are two ways you can get an education. You can educate ex-slaves to be better servants. I, I, I'm going to use this. History is more complicated than this, but hopefully you've heard of some of these. So, you know, you have a Booker T. Washington kind of approach. We, we need to give you better skills so you know how to be a good butler, etc. To do the tasks that the white structure has said you are best fit for because you are inferior. That's very different than a notion that says, yeah, you got to get a job, but we want you to be educated right. so that you can save American democracy so that you can prove that you are not inferior because you're not inferior to white people. So that's a very different approach. And let me put it, in, come back to your question. I am disappointed in public health because we are a multidisciplinary field, at least we used to to be, we're becoming less so with the new Seth criteria, but anyway, um, we have to be transdisciplinary. So the very structure that we use to investigate health inequities is a structure that's based on a bad theoretical framework. So we study variables in certain very specific ways, and even when we put a bunch of them together, we ask ourselves, what is their individual influence? We don't, uh, we don't Again, I'm not an epidemiologist. We don't have good, excellent techniques for this complicated world that we live in, right. in, in spite of our little multi-approaches that didn't exist when I was in school. So the key thing is, where are our measures? And so, so to me, when you work with communities, it's not good enough just to work with communities and get access to your study materials. That's stupid. That happens all the time. You know, but you need to be working with communities so you can learn something from the communities. Okay, so that it can impact our methodology. Where are our methods and measures for racism? 
you know, we use race as a proxy, we use income as a proxy. Where are our methods to look at that? We don't even have in this country a rational discussion. We're not even as good as England in terms of class. You know, where are our measures of community stress? We're talking this with some epidemic. We don't, have, we don't have a measure. You have a measure if you live in the community. Okay. So one example that I've used, so when, when Trump got elected and put in his ridiculous, you know, edicts about uh, immigration in back of the arch, after church, the bakery, the Mexican bakery, which usually has a line, two blocks going around the corner on Sunday after church, all of a sudden there's no line. Now that, that's a measure of community stress right there. It doesn't take a genius. Or in Humboldt Park, some of the elderly Polish all of a sudden need someone to go grocery shopping for them because they're afraid to go out. Because even though the press doesn't understand that they're undocumented Polish, in the real world, we know that. Okay. So we're not, we, don't, we have not had a conversation as scientists about the weaknesses of our theoretical frame, the limitations of the methodologies that we've been trained in. I'm not saying throw them all away. But if you don't understand the theoretical frame that you're operating in, if you don't understand the problems of the historical development of, that epi of those epidemiological techniques, then you're not, it's not possible for you to think about how to develop transdisciplinary methodologies. Now, the sociologists, the anthropologists, the ethnographic people, they have all kinds of other methods. They're scientific, but in public health, we don't teach those methods. We're stuck in a biomedical prison. And we have trouble counting. Okay, we think p-values mean something. So, it, so to me, the scientific community, particularly the public health biomedical community, we have so much to learn from simply working with communities and trying to answer their real questions. And the community is always, they may not have the methodology now, but they're always asking the right questions. If we only listen. But we tend, not, and we haven't been trained even how to listen. So this is not so much transactional, which is how we tend to think about community-based participatory research. I'm not really interested in that part of it. I'm interested in lay scientists developing their own critique, because that's really what Pablo was talking about. Lay scientists can say, this shit doesn't make sense that you're talking about. I don't believe in this. And you can do that. I remember being trained as a young physician to be uh, objective, to be professional, not to reveal your, your personal, you know, feelings. And, you know, and I'm trying to get some 60-year-old uh, black man to get a PSA or to let me do a digital rectal exam. And, like, he ain't feeling it, okay? And I figured out, it didn't, so then I would say, well, you know, my daddy has prostate cancer, and I don't want you to have prostate So now all of a sudden this old black man, he still doesn't want it, but he's distressed because I'm distressed about my daddy. So he agreed. He right. says, oh, well, no, don't be worried. <laughs> yeah, you can do it. Okay. So now how, that's not a, any, any daughter would know that's how you get something, right? <laughs> you know, we know that, right? So how come that's not taught in medical school? We are not, we are not scientific. So if I, I actually don't think the academy offers much to us the way it's presently structured. And I encourage those of you that are in the academy, even if you're only there for a little bit like me, shake it up, ask the questions, ask the questions differently and ask different questions. And don't be afraid to challenge the establishment. Now, if, you, if you're a full-time academic, you have to do NIH grants the way that, you know I mean? I'm, I, I'm not stupid, you have to do it, but you can still push them. You can still, around the margins, challenge them. And even if you have to play their game, be clear that you're playing their game. And teach your students. You know, we're saying this shit because this is the only language that NIH understands. They can't spell public health. They don't, <laughs> which they cannot do. Okay? You know? So, but if you're, not, if you're not willing to do that, then you're not really that much of a scientist. Because we don't need somebody just to repeat the little prayers. It's like a difference between being in the kindergarten and first grade and we just teach you baby stuff and you can go out and sing the nursery rhyme? Or do you want to 
actually create new songs and new rhythms and new dances and explore the world in a different kind of way. Spot on. I, I'm going to open it up because there's only a few more minutes. Um, I, I, can't, I can't say that any better. Spot on. You've got to think about the architecture and design of everything, whether it's the funding opportunity, who funded it, what their board is, the institution, how those processes, who got to this institution and why, who selected that. Everything matters. And yes, you got to shake it up. All right. Questions? Hi, it's so great hearing you guys speak about this. Um, so as a young professional, like what advice do you have for people that want to go into the field and shake it up and change it? You know, I feel like we have to get a PhD kind of to establish expertise before we can start creating our own vision. So really, any advice? <laughs> well, if you are interested in a PhD because it allows you to do some things that make you happy, go ahead and get it. So let me back up. <laughs> All people, you know, you can never have too many letters after your name if you're, if you're oppressed. But don't think that's going to magically mean you can do shit. Okay, so you, so you have, to, so this is, so to me, this is one of the real tragedies of how we train people. It's not like you, you play by all the rules, you get all your degrees, you keep your mouth shut, and one day they make you head of something. Then you don't know what, you don't know how to speak out. So one thing I will say, and, the, and uh, you know, we, we just lost uh, Dr. Jenny Bishop a few weeks ago, um, if you look at Dr. Bishop as someone who was a practitioner but really fought inside this institution, really tried to shake them up, and th that costs you some stuff when you do that, by the way. But, but she made change here. Uh, there's another person, just as an example, you can read about her, Helen Rodriguez Trias. I'm yes. reminded as I, as I think about Jose. Again, one of our real public health leaders, a Puerto Rican, who, who, who started very young, or Mary Bassett, who fortunately is still with us at Harvard. You know, you know I, I was, have a picture of Mary Bassett, the former commissioner of health for New York City, now in faculty of Harvard, when she's like a medical student at one of the Black Panther clinics. So it doesn't, don't wait till you get a PhD. So while you're working on whatever training you're doing, be active in student groups, be active in your community groups, and do stuff. Because otherwise, getting a PhD just means you'll be sophisticated in like doing nothing. Um, the second thing I have to say is don't just do, this is going to sound like what your grandmother told you, don't just do what you have to do to get an A. You have to go beyond that, see, because they're not going to tell you, well, in education school, they might tell you to read Pablo, but generally they don't tell, they don't tell medical students or public health, but you need to do that, you know, find the communities, I, I don't know what area you're trying to get a PhD in, what, okay. So uh, there, there are people in your field that act out. Find them and listen to what they have to say, okay? And read other people that act out. For public health and epi, as we were talking about, start with Nancy Krieger's book about epidemiology and study it and think about what that means and, and be, find out where the arguments are. That's really what public health is really about. It's a, it's a, it's a record of the arguments we have as a society. Uh, which is why I like public health so much. So that means you have to find out where those arguments are. And, you know, in the scientific community, we don't argue like we do on my block where people shout and scream, though. No, they, they do it really quiet and stupid. You know, you, you, it may be an argument in the footnotes or what references they use, but their arguments are there and they're ongoing. So find out and understand the arguments so that then you can join in those arguments. Other Questions, comments? But let me just say something to add a little bit to what Dr. Mary. <clears throat> There's a wonderful quote that I always tell people. It's probably one of the most, not one of the most popular people today, but it's Mao Zedong. Mao Zedong writes a letter to the members of the Communist Party of China. And he says, because obviously the communists thought that they had all the answers and that they obviously understood everything. And this is exactly what happens with academia. We think we know everything. And that we're in this place where we're creating and producing knowledge, which is a lie. Schools do not produce or create knowledge. Knowledge is all around us, 
And all that schools can do is help us to organize and systematize knowledge. So he says in this letter, give back to the people with precision what they have given you in confusion. In other words, what Dr. Murray just said, that listen to the people. They know what's happening. If you listen to them, then you can help to organize and systematize their knowledge and help them to organize and systematize. Not that you own the knowledge, but they own the knowledge. And this is exactly what I think a good health practitioner, a good anyone who's in the academic world has to be humble and understand that humility is one of the best practices of good learning because it's about listening. And when you get someplace, you keep striving for more because you bring the voice of everybody with you. And that's really important. So when somebody asks you to serve on something and you are different and you are of color or you have some diversity aspect, you need to say yes and get that voice to the table. It's really important. I appreciate your comment about institutions could do their part to be less racist or anti-racist. I think a lot of times in academia, they either focus on diversity only or nothing at all. And so a lot of people, even if there are diverse people that rise up through higher education, they experience this toxic culture of racism, sexism, and many other isms. So what do you think academic institutions could do to try to break apart that toxic culture and make people feel more included? So some of the phrasing that you've said here and that they talk about is part of the problem. It's like, we have a perfect world. Oh, we realize we're not quite as diverse as maybe we ought to be. So we'll bring in a few tokens and then we'll have a more perfect world. No, you have a faulty, fundamentally flawed world of white men being doctors, for example. Now, right now in medical school, I think the classes are 50-50 in terms of men versus women. So part of the, the first step is to understand your institution is flawed. You're not trying to bring, you're not doing anybody a favor by bringing, quote, diverse people in. So don't feel good about that. Uh, I, don't, I don't even like this word. I don't even know what this is. And I don't like diversity being linked with equity. What The two have nothing to do with each other or very little to do with each other. You know, so, um, so I think the first step is to say, what should a class at Northwestern look like? Okay. Now, if you want to have a national frame, then fine, let it look like the nation. Or someplace like U of I, it ought to at least look like the state. Okay, I won't quibble over what, you know, where you're bringing from. And if, and if Northwestern Medical School is supposed to reflect th this generation of Americans, then it gets a big F. And having a, sprinkling in a few people in doesn't matter. And the second thing is, when you're diverse, don't be typical idiot white people. Okay, so... You want to, uh, in 1890 or whatever, you want to eliminate Chinese from coming over, so you say Oriental, which doesn't exist, because you can't tell the difference between Chinese and Japanese. You know, don't, don't do that, okay? We want new immigrants to be in medical school. That's not the same as having old populations be here, too. So, you know, be, be explicit. You don't just want dark faces. You need to have people from the African diaspora that reflects the population of this country, okay, which are not all first-generation immigrants, as some schools have. Okay. So, it, so it means even if you're going to be more representative, not diversified, so there's a big difference between saying, I want to have a representative medical school that represents the nation. And that's very different than saying, I want to diversify and just have a few little off-white spots in my class. You know, very different, right? What about class? We know, the, we know the data on class and everything. So, and that means making a decision to make investments years earlier before medical school. Uh, so start with the Evanston campus, the same issues. So um, I, I think that on all of our internal committees, we should be asking ourselves, what's the real, now medical schools are forced to have a diversity officer now, I guess, by ACGME. <laughs> Um, well, that's good. That's better than not. The AAMC is requiring it. That's better than not requiring it. But 
but we should also say what what is our obligation? Think about all the public money that Northwestern gets from the absurd money they take from NIH and the R ones and all that stuff. Is it fifty percent or fifty two percent? Yes, it's some ridiculous amount. Um, to the Medicaid, Medicare dollars, to the land that they're sitting on, give something back to the nation, right? How do how do how do we make sure that that happens? Um, and that's not just a few scholarships. It means what we study. That means change. And I, so if we start these changes, if you start changing the medical schools, then you can begin to change, for example, NIH. One good thing that I thought was a major advance, and I hope we can do this with the MCATs, this is something we've been fighting for for my whole career. So the part one of the boards, they've now decided they're going to be pass-fail. For those of you, for those of you that, that don't know these uh, innards of craziness in, in medicine, this wasn't true when I was coming up, but now they, they've decided that if you don't score a high score on your licensing, part one of your licensing boards, they won't even interview you for a residency. I wasn't interviewed here because of Okay. Even though I graduated near the top of my class in medical school, I got a So, so which is all absurd. So people have been so now they've made a decision that that's going to be passed. I would love a decision with the MCATs, which is our entry exam for medical. If they if they were just like three scores, you're ready for medical school. You are not ready for medical school, and you might be with a little help ready for medical school. That's that, you know that that makes more sense, right? Because I can tell you, any person who can read and has enough sense to get up out of the bed and make it somewhere on time, I can make them into an excellent doctor. I don't care what, you know, I don't care if they got C, it doesn't matter. You know, if, they, if they're basically like a human, you can do it. <laughs> not all medical schools are human, not all medical students are human, but if you're a human being, we can get it done. So, um, so I think it means turn, and, and I think we can challenge all of that. And where and where people have in education, where people have challenged that. I was just this morning uh, on the way in. I'm listening to NPR, and they were talking about I think it was Statesville or something. That was it, Northwestern. Somebody, one of our was was it Northwestern? Yeah, there you go. Now they may be. I wasn't shocked that some Northwestern humanities teacher could go to Statesville and have an intelligent class. And I'm like, well, she obviously doesn't know anybody that's been in Statesville because the people I know are very intelligent, but, you know. So, but, so our notions about what, who's in jail and why they're in jail, if she understood why they were in jail, she wouldn't be surprised. Okay. So, and this gets ingrained, and it's not, I, I was, I'll say this, it's not just in whites. Um, uh, one, there was one black, nice young man, black medical student in, uh, at, University of Chicago a few years ago was helping us do some focus groups around with black men. And uh, he was he was born and raised in the hood. His daddy was a Baptist pre preacher. So he was, you know, he wasn't one of these suburban folks. That did, he was from the community. And so as he finishes his time with us, I said, well, what did you? He said, I learned how out of it I was because all of these men, whether they were on drugs, whether they were gay, whether they were poor, he said, they're all so intelligent. I said, and he said, he said, I feel so bad because I should have known that. But I've grown up in this son of a preacher, uh, you know, in medical school notion, acting like I'm so much better. And, and when we're having real discussions about real issues, I'm, I'm like a little boy. I said, well, you are a little boy to them. They were grown men, you know. So, the, you know. <laughs> so, so that's what we mean when we say listen to the community. When you talk to people and listen to people, it's really amazing how brilliant human beings are. And if we could just get some of this nonsense out the way and we could find a way to connect and organize and work together and build the power that we need, because that's what it takes. It takes power. It doesn't take a p-value. It takes power <laughs> to make changes in the society. And with that,